Good evening. Can you all hear me? I can't hear me very well, but I assume that you can. Good. Uh, my name is Natalia Imperatori Lee. I'm Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College in the Bronx. And I'm also a graduate of Fordham's Theology Department. Yeah. Wow. So Fordham, is, as an undergraduate, is a place where I first came set my mind and my heart on fire. And it wound up really determining the path of my life, as you can tell from my job description. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome you today specifically to a conversation that I think exemplifies the gift that Fordham theology has, which is a gift for seeing the signs of the times and interpreting them in light of the gospel, as Gaudium et Spes calls us to do. Our conversation tonight will, I hope, demonstrate to you the kind of discourse that Fordham trains theologians in, and the kind it hopes to foster in its public role in the church and in the broader world. Now, because I want there to be as much time as possible for conversation, and because we got started a little bit late, I'm gonna make a couple of announcements now. First of all, and most importantly, I wanna thank everyone who made this evening possible, the Department of Theology at Fordham, the Office of Alumni Relations, and America Media. Secondly, I'd like to welcome all of those who are joining us via the live stream, um, including my friend Christy Gomez. <laughs> Hi, Christy. We've Hi, known Christy. each other since high school. <laughs> um, I also like to invite you at the end of our conversation time here to join us for a brief reception outside where there will be dessert and more conversation if you don't get a chance to um, engage today. Our dialogue partners are people who are very well known, and so I won't take too much time introducing them. Father Jim Martin is a New York Times best-selling author of 12, 12 books, <laughs> uh, including Building a Bridge, How the Catholic Church and the LGBT Community Can Enter into a Relationship of Respect, Compassion, and Sensitivity, which is this evening's topic. You've seen him on The Colbert Report and other media appearances. He's become a public figure in our national discourse. Our conversation partner that is seated to my left is Patrick Hornbeck, and he is the chair of the Department of Theology at Fordham University. He holds degrees from Oxford and Georgetown, and his research, fittingly, is in the interplay between heresy and orthodoxy in medieval <laughs> <laughs> and early modern Christianity, so the man knows a thing or two. You, the audience, are also a conversation partner this evening, and I invite you to use the index cards and pencils that have been provided to you, I think either as you walked in the door or there are people circulating who have them, to jot down your questions. Toward the end of the evening, those questions will be brought up to me, and I will try to incorporate as many of them as I can into our conversation. Does that sound good? Yeah. Excellent. So, that's what we're doing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's begin then by allowing our speakers to briefly introduce their perspectives. So we're going to start with Jim. Jim, can you tell us a bit about the book, Building a Bridge, about um, the process of revising it, what revisions you're trying to make, et cetera? Just give us a little, you know, elevator pitch. Sure. Uh, the elevator pitch. First of all, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick and Natalia. I am here with two PhDs, uh, and um, well, <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. So the book, uh, very briefly, Building a Bridge, um, started after the uh, Orlando massacres at the uh, nightclub, the gay nightclub called Pulse. Uh, significant outpourings of sympathy and expressions of grief uh, among some quarters in our church. The U.S. bishops, for the most part, for the most part, with some significant exceptions, were silent. And even those few people who spoke out uh, could barely bring themselves to use the words LGBT or gay. And to me, to quote another favorite theologian, Jim Keenan, uh, professor of moral theology at BC, who came to me book example, Jesus' way of looking at sin, which is, Jim Keenan would say that in the Gospels, uh, for Jesus, it, uh, sin is, off, is, is not uh, where people are uh, weak, mm -hmm. 
So for, isn't that beautiful? So for Jim, for Jesus, sin is a failure to bother to love. And so it seemed to me that the bishops, most of the bishops, and in a sense the church, because they represent the church for so many people, failed to bother. So I did a um, Facebook video, a very sort of guerrilla kind of Facebook video, um, overnight um, and uh, posted it on Facebook. It got a lot of hits about my frustration about that and just sort of expressing my sympathy. And around the same time, uh, New Ways Ministry, a group that advocates for and ministers to LGBT Catholics, approached me to see if I would accept an award called the Bridge Building Award. And um, I had done what I would call informal ministry, like many people in the church, priests, deacons, brothers, sisters, lay workers do with LGBT people but had never really done what I would call sort of formal ministry, right? So I asked permission from my provincial, uh, from the editor-in-chief of America Magazine, from the provincial of the Maryland province, because this is where the talk was going to be, and I even wrote to Archbishop Lurie uh, and asked him, or told him that I was coming. And so I gave this talk at New Ways Ministry, and the idea was a two-way bridge. Um, uh, using the virtues of respect, compassion, and sensitivity that are found in the catechism under the discussion of homosexual persons, as they call them, or as, as it calls them. And also called, so to call the church to respect, compassion, and sensitivity for the LGBT community, and which was you know, more difficult for me to do, the LGBT community to respect, to have respect, compassion, and sensitivity for the institutional church. I think one revision, the, there's gonna be a revision coming out in a couple of months, I think I would have been clearer about where the onus lies, which is primarily on the institutional church, because it is the institutional church that has marginalized the LGBT person, not vice versa. So that's the book, that's only actually part one of the book. Part one, I would say, is an invitation to dialogue. That's part one. Part two is an invitation to prayer. So the second part is uh, scripture passages and meditation questions and reflection questions for primarily LGBT Catholics and as well as their families and friends and allies, but also for the church at large. So it's a kind of two-part book and, and it was a very modest attempt um, within the parameters you know, of my Jesuit life and my Jesuit vocation to contribute something. I actually have been surprised that the, uh, I mean, I've talked to both of you privately as friends, but I've been surprised at the um, reaction, which has, I mean, and I consider myself having worked in a media ministry in America for 20 years, fairly, as most people in the audience are, fairly uh, cognizant of what people will say, but I, I had no idea there was going to be this kind of uh, reaction, both positive and negative. And I'll, I'll just briefly say, from the positive side, going to parishes and having people cry when they met me and standing ovations and huge crowds and all out of proportion to what I would say is a fairly mild book. And also, really, and also, when I can unpack that later, and also the negative side, near hysterical reactions from people uh, who I would say seem to be opposed even to the minimum, which is listening to people. So, so that's a kind of, that's my, that's a very long elevator ride. But, <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, one World Trade Center elevator pitch. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So Patrick. You're part of this conversation, too. Your part is a theological part. Yes, yeah, so I, first of all, I want to thank um, the same group of people that, that Natalia and Jim just thanked. Um, we, we have such a delightful and wonderful community of friends of the theology department who are here, so we welcome you back. Natalia, thank you for, for playing your role tonight. I want to single out Jim for special thanks. Um, over the course of this conversation, you will discover that there are uh, a, a few places where we disagree. Um, we hope to model disagreeing in charity and friendship and, and all the things that don't happen as much in our culture. But I, Jim, I want to say thank you for writing this book. You have performed a great service. Um, I think all of us who are here can agree that you have put issues on the table in a new way, and we are just thrilled to have you back at Fordham. So thank, so you. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the last set of thanks is one that actually has been overdue for a couple of years. I realized, um, so two years ago, uh, my husband and I got married in June of 2015. And Jim was talking about hysterical reactions. Um, <laughs> and there were a number of those at the time. And Fordham did mm. something truly exceptional, which is that Fordham University put out a statement saying, we wish many blessings to Professor Hornbeck and his spouse. 
Um, and just as a human being, not to mention a theologian, I want to say thank you to the university, everyone from the president on down who's stood with us and, and supported us in that process. <laughs> So Jim's book. Um, <laughs> when I picked up Jim's book, I thought a lot about my 20-year-old self. Mm -hmm. So I was a, a junior or a senior at Georgetown. I was just on the verge of coming out. Um, I was very actively involved in campus ministry, in uh, the life of the Jesuit community. There was a period when I was discerning the possibility of a vocation to the Jesuits. Um, and I think as a 20-year-old, I would have loved this book. Mm -hmm. I think I would have taken this book and I would have said yes. Um, respect, compassion, sensitivity, um, both of these parties, the institutional church and the LGBT community need to offer those gifts to one another. Um, and I think I would have been particularly moved by, by Jim's suggestion that what needs to happen um, on the part of the LGBT, LGBT community is to give the institutional church the gift of time. Um, it's a really, really beautiful metaphor that Jim uses. Um, I think the downside though is that it's potentially quite dangerous. Uh, because we have to ask the question, what is the cost to the members of the LGBT community to give the gift of time? Uh, so people who are here know that suicide rates among LGBT teens are three to four times higher um, than non-LGBT teens. Uh, people here know that in, uh, in states and in jurisdictions where uh, there are not laws that protect LGBT people from firing, for instance, or otherwise, um, the incidence of mental health um, disorders is about five times higher. And so I think in the weighing up of these issues, we have to ask ourselves, what is the cost of the gift of time? And I say that with the deepest amount of respect uh, for people who have decided uh, that they are Catholics, that they are standing in their church, that whatever might be said by people who claim to speak for that church, um, that they are going to claim their home. And I think those people give us an incredible model of loyalty and perseverance and commitment. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's the full story. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great gifts I've had here at Fordham is the opportunity to spend some time with our foreign exchange partners in South Africa. Um, and in South Africa, as many of you know, they are currently at the, you know, in the middle of two or three decades of reconciliation after apartheid. Um, and one of their great leaders, Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop um, of Cape Town, um, he said, it's only an honest confrontation with reality that can bring about real healing. That if we have only superficial reconciliation, we can only have superficial healing. And so the thing that I think we have to deal with in this conversation isn't just respect and compassion and sensitivity, even though those are the starting points. What we have to do is ask the deeper theological question, and as Natalia was saying, what is it that the institutional church is saying about LGBT people? about LGBT law right. And if it is right, what follows from that? And if it's not right, what follows from that? So, so part of that dialogue in truth is figuring out what this teaching does to folks. And that's something I'm really excited to talk about here as well. So thank you all very, very much again for coming. Excellent. So let's hop in. Tell me about the bridge, Jim. <laughs> is it the George Washington Bridge? <laughs> Where the LGBT community is Jersey? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and after that sort of facetious question, let me ask That's actually a great question. question. That's a good question. Like, is it, and, and as a feminist, feminist theologians face this, who, feminist theologians who stay in the church, um, I think Black Lives Matter is facing this mm -hmm. on a nationwide scale or whatever. How do you extend the gift of time and patience and compassion and sensitivity to a group or you know, individuals, I don't want to make blanket statements, to people who think you do not exist or should not mm -hmm. exist in mm -hmm. the fullness of your life? What do you think people are called to in this dialogue? Those are great questions. Let me answer, let me just respond to what Patrick's, thank you, Patrick, because that's, Patrick does model uh, and it's not big disagreement, but uh, critique in a really wonderful way. Um, I would, to respond to Patrick, I would say um, that the gift of time, that was a very hard thing for me to write. And I, one of the things I said was, look, you know, take the best and leave the rest, as we say in the Jesuits. <laughs> I, but I, I would say that, I would say that uh, 
I think it sounds better in Latin. Um, <laughs> I would say that I don't think we're even there yet. I think that's the problem. And when I say the gift of time, I mean that for me, so many bishops don't even know LGBT people. And so that's, the, that's what I'm trying to get at, that we're not even, we're not even at the t place where they can even talk to them because they don't know them. So the gift of time is just basically letting, them, letting the institutional church get to know the community by sort of standing up. Um, for those of you who aren't New Yorkers, uh, yes, the uh, GW Bridge, as you probably know, is closed down by uh, an associate of Governor Christie. <laughs> <laughs> And we hope that the LGBT community is not Fort Lee. Um, I think they're more like uh, Fort Tryon Park. Um, no, I think that, that the bridge is really, um, it was a metaphor that, that New Ways Ministry came up with. I think that the bridge means that both sides are going to be, in a sense, disappointed because they have to take steps towards one another, steps that they won't particularly always agree with. And I think one of the things is the LGBT community may have to, and this, this is just my opinion, may have to take steps forward, like the gift of time, that may rankle them, and that may grate on them. At the same time, the bishops, and the, and I, the institutional church in this book, I mean, different, maybe different than what a theologian would say, the institutional church for me is certainly the, the, the Pope, the Vatican, the hierarchy, the clergy, but also lay Catholics who work in any official capacity in the church. So from my point of view, a lay woman teacher who is the president of a Jesuit, a, yeah, Jesuit high school, as we have now, or a Catholic high school, is the institutional church because she can fire or hire somebody. And I think that part of the institutional church may have to do things that will rankle them which is like, for example, you know, talk to an LGBT person who's married, right? I mean, that, that might grate on them. So the bridge, I think, is a, it's an imperfect metaphor, but I think it's an important one in terms of reminding people that there is a middle that is going to take tolls, basically, to use some Christy, Chris Christie metaphors. <laughs> now, and what was your second question? I want to get well, to that. The, the question is about what, how do you counsel, like for instance, you've done yeah. informal counseling of a lot of people in the, of LGBT Catholic. How do you counsel people to enter into dialogue? Like, where is, when is the cost too much? That is a great question. And I would say uh, that, you know, it really depends on the person, mm. you know? Most, many LGBT people that I counsel really aren't even at this level. I mean, you know, how, how many of us dialogue with the institutional church in any sort of formal way. Now, there are some people that I've met who are doing that, right? My experience, and this is why I've pushed back against some people who have reduced the book to questions of chastity, which seems to be the only response. My, my own experience, and this is once again my own experience, is that most LGBT Catholics simply at this point in our life, our church life, want to feel welcome in their parish. That's what they, in my experience, that's what they want. They, the younger ones want to know that they're loved by God. Although that's changing, I think, you know, teenagers are much more comfortable with their own sexuality. But they want to know that they belong and that they have a place in the dialogue. But I do want to tell you a story. And this goes to Patrick's question, too. So I was speaking at uh, Yale University, which is another school north of here, um, <laughs> at the Catholic Center. And a man stood up, and I have this, I, I've asked his permission to use this in the next edition. And a man stood up and said, Father, my son is gay, and my, he was about 60, and my wife and I have welcomed him. And my bishop, it wasn't in the Hartford Diocese, my bishop is very antipathetic to gay people. And at confirmations, he has spoken against same-sex marriage. So I wrote him a very angry letter, says the man, and he wrote me a very angry letter back. And then I had a sort of a change of heart and I realized he was my brother in Christ and I wrote him a more conciliatory letter and he wrote me a conciliatory letter back. For an hour, where I talked about my experience as the father of a gay son and he talked about his experience, and he talked about his views on courage and always our children, the, the pastoral letter. And then we met again. 
And now this is a bishop who's very suspicious of the LGBT community. And this is a man who, you know, himself obviously has a lot invested in it. Now why am I bringing, why am I bringing this up? In my experience, this is the kind of dialogue that our bishops, rightly or wrongly, respond to. You know what I mean? So part of that is sort of being patient with Catholic leaders. And one of the things that this man said, which really struck me, was he said to the bishop, you know, this is my son's experience. The bishop said, quote, well, why would your son feel rejected in church? <laughs> now, what's the point? The point is that this man, this adult, had to be, in a sense, patient with this bishop who had, in fact, never met or spoken to the parent of a gay man. So that's more the gift of time. It's, and, and, and you can disagree, and, and people have. I tend to think that particular mode of dialogue works best. And that, that's, sort of my, that, that's been my, my sense. Now, people have disagreed, and, they, and that's fine. But that's what I mean in a sense by the gift of time. And, and, and so the counseling that I do to get back to your question is more on the level of a person's individual relationship to God or, or to their church, less about dialogue. Okay. So I want to talk more about the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not a native New Yorker, and I was shocked when I moved here. And I learned that you pay a toll going one way, and then the other way they just let you out for free. <laughs> it's just shocking how that works. And I think, Natalia, that's what you were getting at, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the reason in the metaphor the LGBT community is New Jersey is that in order to be on the bridge, we have to pay. Mm -hmm. And for the institutional church to be on the bridge going to New Jersey, maybe the cost is less. Maybe, I, I don't want to make the case that the cost is nothing. Right, because these are human beings, these are people with their own sets of issues that they're grappling with and questions and really, really committed beliefs. Um, but it's that toll, it's that unequal toll that I think we have to wrestle really carefully with. So I just want to go back to the examples that Jim gave us. Um, the principal of a Catholic high school has to become uncomfortable by being in a room and having a conversation with a gay person. What does the gay person have to give up, mm -hmm. right? So when, when, when an LGBT person comes and sits in a, in a church space, the, the presuppositions, the theological presuppositions that are at work in that space include the idea that, they are, um, that their um, attractions are objectively disordered. Um, it includes the position that the institutional church has taken um, that just discrimination is possible. In fact, that just discrimination is required by society between LGBT people and heterosexual people. Um, they have to take the threat of being fired, going into that conversation with the principal. Even coming out, there's, there's a danger. And so there's a whole long list of things we could think about. Um, I remember an article back almost a decade ago um, called What Should the Gay Catholic Do? Um, and in the article, um, it laid out a list of things that you can't do if you're a gay Catholic and you want to live in connection with church teaching. Um, so you can't um, engage in romantic love. You can't get married, you can't adopt, you can't enter the seminary, um, you can't work openly in a Catholic institution. And, and since Jim wrote that article back in 2009, um, <laughs> one of the things that I think we need to engage in, when is it worth being paid? When is it worth being paid? Like, when is yeah. it worth paying that price in order and, to engage in and, that? And I would like to say, uh, you know, I think that depends on the individual, because I also don't, do not want to undercut the value of, which I say in the book, prophecy and prophetic action. Mm -hmm. you know? Interestingly, I would suggest though, and this, I don't mean to step on your moderator's shoes. Don't worry, um, <laughs> I'll let you know. I, I sometimes think, and, and I'm curious to know what you think, Patrick, and, and Natalia as well. I sometimes think that in discussions about this topic, that is LGBT Catholics and the church and the catechism. That LGBT Catholics are more centered, educated, and experienced than some of the church leaders to whom they're talking. Uh -huh. And so in a sense, they are more comfortable with this. Uh -huh. What do you think about that? I think I mean, you're absolutely right. I think we have to ask the question, why is that the case? Right. Because the reason that LGBT Catholics have to learn where the boundaries are, what's permitted and what's not permitted, 
um, is because is precisely because the cost of transgressing those boundaries can be so high. Mm -hmm. And so I know, I imagine all three of us up here on the stage have engaged over the years in some sort of informal conversations with LGBT Catholics. I know you have, you've written about it in the book. Um, I mean, we all do, especially those of us who are teachers. And, and I remember a, a year ago, someone coming to me who teaches in a Catholic high school, uh, was thinking about getting married to his maybe by now husband. And the question was, do I need to look for another job? Mm -hmm. And so it's only when you're in a situation of potentially losing your livelihood, mm -hmm. uh, potentially in a situation of losing the respect of your community, potentially being in a situation, Jim, you have some wonderful stories, um, actually they're, they're horrific stories of, you know, will I be anointed when I'm dying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so in that situation, the LGBT Catholic has to learn the rules as a survival strategy. Mm -hmm. And so, so why I think we, while I think we should praise that, why I think we should say that's a good thing, mm -hmm. We also have to remember that the darker piece of it mm -hmm. is it's because we have mm -hmm. to. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what we're talking about here is the sort of price that's paid inadvertently by anyone who's in a marginalized community. Right? When you live on the margin, the margin is your business. Absolutely. And you know exactly where the line is, and you know which parts of it are alarmed, and which parts have barbed wire, mm -hmm. and where you really have sort of danger zones. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons, I think, for this sense of, this overwhelming, I think, sense of marginalization among LGBT Catholics is the language of the catechism. Now, let me preface this by saying that we are lay theologians with tenure. <laughs> <laughs> And because of that, weirdly, and also because we're late, well, I'm a lay person in the Roman Catholic Church and a woman, it, nobody cares what I say. <laughs> so there's good and bad in that, as you probably know. I can say whatever I want, and to a lot of extent, Patrick can say whatever he wants, because we speak for ourselves and our intellectual endeavors, whereas Jim does not have that freedom. And we should sort of, I am very aware of that as we're up here, that Jim is a Jesuit and speaks from that place in a collar right now in public. So At a Jesuit university. At a Jesuit right? university. <laughs> Nevertheless, right, one suggestion that you make in your text that I think that was very moving for me is this idea that perhaps the church might think about in terms of its building, its half of the bridge, or its mm -hmm. part of the bridge, moving beyond the language of intrinsic disorder. What prompted you to put that in the book? And what do you think, if you feel comfortable, of course. what do you think would happen if, something, if some linguistic change were to come about? That's a great question. Uh, why did I put that in my book? Because uh, as I unpack these virtues of respect, compassion, and sensitivity, which I don't really know, I mean, they came from the catechism. I wonder if the person who dashed that off once knew that you know, I was going to be <laughs> unpacking them like this. But sensitivity uh, means being sensitive to a person's feelings. Uh, that also means being sensitive to the language that you use. And there is no... There is no other phrase, as far as I know, other than objectively disordered and intrinsically disordered, which refers to, alternately, depending on what you're reading, the sexual orientation, the sexual act that has made people, LGBT people, feel so marginalized, uh, so less than, so subhuman, so uh, just, uh, yeah, subhuman. I was at a, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing this revision is that since I've been talking about this, people have come up to me and this woman came up to me who was the mother of a, a gay boy and she said, quote, do they understand what that kind of language could do to a 14 year old boy? I'll never forget this, this was just a couple weeks ago and she said, it can destroy him. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, several bishops I was happy to see at the Senate of uh, Bishops on the Family, which was 2015 to 2016, suggested this. Suggested. Well, that's not even your idea. Correct. Uh, it was not my idea. I fob it off on other bishops. Um, because uh, what was Pope Francis doing? One of the ways that he organized that synod, which, was, uh, 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 which really was on the human family, but of course raised all sorts of questions on sexuality, which I think is Francis's clever way of. People are like, oh, the family, that's a nice thing to talk about. You know, but it's divorce, remarry Catholics, it's homosexuality, it's all those kinds of things. 
he sent out um, uh, a request to have surveys taken and to have the bishops really listen. And I think, you know, bishops really did listen and they brought those concerns, uh, including the concerns of their LGBT, uh, you know, parishioners and Catholics to the Synod. And so several of the bishops said, we need to start thinking about setting that kind of language aside. And I think that uh, certainly, that language, which has been so, which is highly, you, and as I'm sure it'll explain, highly philosophical and theological. People say, well, it doesn't mean, it, it, nonetheless, it is extremely damaging. It is needlessly hurtful. Uh, and, and I think it's time for at least an updating of it. I met a, an Italian theologian, a young, young theologian, who talked about, for example, like a, an intermediary step would be differently ordered. You know, that, that, that LGBT people are just sort of different in their, in their sort of aff affections, of course. But I would say that if the Catholic Church really wants to be serious about speaking to people, they have to be attentive to the language they use. And one more brief thing. When Jesus spoke to the people of his time, he physically went to where they were. So he goes from, we read in the gospel today, he goes from Nazareth to Capernaum to call uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John. He literally goes to where they are. And then when he's there, the call, right, from uh, Luke chapter five, how does he speak to them? He's the, we tend to forget this. He is a carpenter from Nazareth. He has spent 30 years as a carpenter. Does he say, we might laugh, let us lay the foundations of God's reign. I'm, I'm glad you laughed. That's what a carpenter would say. That's a carpenter's language. Does he say, let us sand down the rough edges of humanity? <laughs> yeah, you know, you only laugh because that's not what we read in the Bible every, you know, every other Sunday. Does he say, let us construct God's house? No, he says to the two fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, come after me and I will make you fish for people. He's speaking to them in their language, and he does a miracle in front of Luke that is about what? Fish. Even his actions are conformed to them. So if the church wants to really speak to and welcome LGBT people, it must be attentive to the language in the catechism. And I can think of no other two words that are as fraught with people and that can, uh, fraught for people and that can destroy people. And so we need not only to speak their language theologically and philosophically, but we need to be attentive to how that language is, to use a theological term, received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I put it in there, and that's why I invite the, the institutional church to reflect on particularly those two words. Mm -hmm. So, fellow theologians, um, <laughs> at the Second Vatican Council, we know there was a big fight over the word choice between est, right, the kingdom of God, est oh, is... You're doing the Latin. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's Latin. Uh, where the kingdom of God is the Catholic Church, uh -huh. or the kingdom of God subsisted, right? Is mm -hmm. in, subsists in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And it was a knockdown drag out, and eventually, it really was, and eventually it, we settled, or the bishops settled, on subsists in, which was a change, mm -hmm. a linguistic change that happens in the church, whether we admit it or not. So, do you have any suggestions for what the linguistic change might be and what sort of ripple effects that might have? See, this is why it's helpful to study heresy and orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things I want to reflect on is I think everything that Jim just said is exactly right. Um, the, the language of intrinsic disorder um, and the notion that certain acts are objectively disordered, um, these are incredibly painful words. In the book, you call them needlessly cruel. I think that's entirely right. Um, so I'm going to put on my, my theologian hat since Natalia um, invited me to, and I hope you all stick with me for like two minutes. So this is the simple tour through Thomas Aquinas. Um, so this language of order and disorder comes from Thomas Aquinas. He gets it from Aristotle originally. And the notion of being ordered basically means that something is aiming at some particular end. right? So it's what we would think of today as natural law reasoning. Um, I hear with my ear, the ear is set up for hearing. The ear is not set up for eating. If I try to eat with my ear, that's not going to work out so well. If I try to hear with my mouth, that's not going to work out so well. So things are ordered to their particular end. That's where the language comes from. So we can move out of the frame of, of hearing and eating into the realm of, of sexuality. And the Catholic Church's teaching with regard to sexuality, and not just on LGBT issues, um, is that um, heterosexual sex within marriage, which is ordered to two things, procreation of children and the unity of the couple, 
um, can be morally good. Um, and all other forms of sexual activity, or to those two things, are intrinsically bad. So that's where we get the language of intrinsic disorder from, we being the, the catechism and the institutional church. Um, it, it, it's a way of articulating philosophically the idea that these particular types of activities are not ordered to the end for which God created human sexuality. And of course, you all don't need me to point out that this is what's at the bedrock of intra-Catholic debates about contraception as well, right? Because the idea is you have to have both the possibility for procreation and the possibility of, of greater unity within the couple. So, so that's what the teaching is. And it's on the basis of that teaching that the church has been able to say, well, we can justly discriminate between those who are engaged in this type of sexual activity, which is rightly ordered, or is usually, or can be rightly ordered. Not all heterosexual sex is, of course, rightly ordered in this view. Um, so we can discriminate between that on the one hand and, and same-sex sexual activity, which by its very nature is not rightly ordered, right? Uh, so that's where this language comes from. And it's so important to understand the history of that uh, because it plays into this question about linguistics. So, so when Jim says the language is needlessly cruel, and we need to think about maybe coming up with some other language to do so. My question, I'd love to hear, Jim, what you have to say about this, is, is it that we take that teaching and we just say it nicer? <laughs> or is the idea that this notion of differently ordered would actually revise our understanding of what sexuality is ordered to in the beginning? Because those are two really different kinds of things. One of them might be expressing welcome in a way that maybe would persuade more people um, to, to be part of the church, to be engaged in the church, even though they understand that they're still being told that their sexuality is not rightly ordered? Um, or is it that we actually have to change our concept of human sexuality? And that is the issue, Natalia. That's the theological issue that's right there. <laughs> yeah. No, it really is. I think it's the elephant in the room. It's where we're going next. Sorry, Jim. Um, it's th is the notion of sexuality, right? Um, I teach a sexuality course at Manhattan College, and we talk a fair amount about this. Jim, you've been critiqued by everybody for either not talking enough about sex or not talking enough about chastity. Right. Nobody seems happy with the amount of sex in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Why did not you say more things about Why sex? Why did in I the not book? say? Actually, I would say um, that for many LGBT people, as, as both of you know, uh, that question is decided. Right? And so uh, many people who I meet, particularly I've done most of the talks in parishes, uh, that doesn't bother them. Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're happy. Then this is this is not. I'm, this, I'm repeating what people said to me. They're happy just that the discussion is being uh, started, and they're particularly happy that a priest is standing up and saying, "Let's start the conversation." So that that's usually the response I get. The the chastity stuff um, I get uh, from the some in the LGBT community, not not all, uh, that you should have come out in favor of same sex marriage and same you know and same sex relations basically. Uh, from the, some I would say on the uh, traditionalist Catholics, it's you didn't talk enough about chastity. But, you know, my response is, which, you know, was, was intentional in the book, uh, was that this is not a book on moral theology, because frankly, and that was, I wish I had you in uh, my, for my Aquinas class. Don't tell Jim Keenan. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. No, I didn't say I wish I had you for moral theology. <laughs> but no, that's a very good explanation of Aquinas. Because I'm not a moral theologian. That's, that's, that's the primary reason that I didn't write about it. It is not a book on moral theology. It really is an invitation to dialogue. So I intentionally left out chastity. And the other thing is, I feel that many LGBT issues are always about chastity. And the main critique I'm getting is, is the book was not about that. And second of all, they know it already. There is no sentient adult LGBT Catholic who does not understand and know the church is teaching on chastity. And so that's one of the reasons I left it out. But more to the point, the book is more an invitation to dialogue. And, and a colleague that I work with, Jim Keane, um, suggested this to me, which was a really interesting insight. And I was struggling to, oftentimes when you hear someone else kind of uh, articulate something that you've been trying to do, it's very helpful. 
And he said to me, you know, um, if you were trying to build a bridge to divorced Catholics, you would not always say to them, what about adultery? What about sex? And I really do feel that so many conversations about LGBT Catholics are, and I'm not saying you're doing this, are reduced to just sex. And so given that I'm not a moral theologian, I didn't write a, want to write a book about moral theology, I'm not gonna write a book about sexual ethics for the LGBT person, I wanted to write a book about dialogue. And I think it's interesting for me that both sides, it is the elephant in the room, continually come back to sex. And I think that's actually more a problem for people on the right. Um, for me, uh, I find it, this is, not, this is not you guys, I find it frustrating and sad that the only way that many Catholics, that some Catholics on the right can look at LGBT people is through the lens of sex, which for them is the lens of sin. And so I don't understand why for the people on the right, that the sexual morality of LGBT people uh, takes precedence over almost anything else. And such that if we were talking to a group of uh, married people, again, we would not be saying, all right, now how many of you practice birth control? How many of you are cheating on your wives? How many of you are divorced and remarried? How many of you um, lived together before you were married? And so there's this kind of, from the right, this relentless focus on chastity, sexuality, and I wanted to actually move away from that and to say, a person can walk into a room who's an LGBT person and be treated like a person without the priest or the bishop or the sister saying, you know, are you having sex? Because they are more than that. You know, that's part of their lives, certainly, and that is the elephant in the room, but I intentionally left that out in order to start this dialogue. Um, and again, there are certain things that I can talk about and can't talk about in terms of my uh, being a priest and a Jesuit, but also in terms of my expertise. You know, I'm a celibate male, first of all, you know. And secondly, um, I'm not a moral theologian. So I intentionally left that stuff out. All right, Patrick, it's the elephant in the room. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Did you bring an elephant? Oh, oh very nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. I didn't know there would be props. <laughs> so, I, as I mentioned before, I teach this class in sexuality, and it's sexuality and the sacred, so it's not just Catholicism. But many of my students are Catholic, and one of the exercises that I have them do um, is to, to try to develop a list of rules, moral rules, for good sex. Like, can sex ever be morally good, or is it just morally not bad? Mm. Morally, morally, not, not bad. Bad, bad. Not less morally bad. Not bad. Is it just degrees of badness, or is there ever goodness? And I find that my students, Catholicism, cannot conceive of anything but less bad, and they don't know that there are any ways in which the church would endorse human sexuality of any stripe. Whether, even if it is sort of within the bounds of marriage, without the use of contraception, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my question to you is, is there such a thing as good sex? Can we talk about good sex, or is sex only ever less bad? And what you mentioned about um, Aquinas and the notion of being ordered is pulling out this idea of intrinsically or objectively disordered going to unravel a lot more than the church has bargained for? I think that's a great question. Um, so I actually think, I mean, the elephant is sex, and I wanted to put it on the table because there's more to this question than just that. Um, so, so let's talk about relationships, mm -hmm. right? So, so I've only been married for, for two and a half years, but I, I'm coming to learn that there's a lot more to marriage than, than sex, right? <laughs> like, we all learned that. Um, and, yeah. and, and the reason I say that is that in the focus on the specific morality of specific sexual acts, mm -hmm. and Natalia was someone who, who really, um, really taught me this, um, that in, in the Catholic Church, when we talk about sex, sexual ethics, um, it's one of the few places where we talk about an act-based morality. Mm -hmm rather than thinking about sort of a broad sort of orientational morality or, or relational. relational is a better word than that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it seems to me that, that 
what the, what the teaching on the morality of LGBT lives and orientations is about isn't just the morality of what particular sex acts people might get up to, but more about the um, And so what I think is actually a far greater tragedy than the, the ban and the language of intrinsic disorder about um, same-sex relations is the notion that relationships can't be life-giving. Mm. And so one of the things that's been most sad to me as I look at these various uh, Vatican documents and even the USCCB's document, um, in 2005, the Vatican, as you may know, put out an instruction through the Congregation for Catholic Education um, saying that gay men should not apply to or be accepted into seminaries. Um, and the reason for this is really interesting because it's not a fear that, that these gay men will be less true to their vows than, than heterosexual men would be. Um, it's that they're in a state of affective immaturity that hinders them from relating well to both men and women. So it's about relationships far more than it's about sex. Then the other piece, too, I, I actually, so I, I, I read Supreme Court decisions for fun. I'm a real geek. Um, and I went back, actually, I was just thinking about it this morning. Um, the US bishops filed what's called an amicus brief in the Obergefell decision two years ago. Um, and, and an amicus brief, for those of you who are not sort of legal people, is um, when a court is hearing a case, you can come to the court and say, you know, I have some vested interest in this. I'd like to advise you that you rule this way or that way. Um, and, and so what the, what the bishops say in their amicus brief for Obergefell um, is that it is just to discriminate between opposite sex couples and same sex couples uh, because we should treat different things differently. That is their exact line. We should treat different things differently. And so it's the quality of the relationships, even before we get into talking about the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. that's really important. Is it possible for two men or two women um, to have a loving relationship that reveals the reign of God. Um, and, and that is where the real sadness lies. It's not necessarily, and we can have all sorts of really interesting debates about when sex is good and bad. I do promise, I do really want to answer your question. Um, but, but I want to focus on this relational component because that's a place where even when people might disagree on matters of sexual morality, we can surely agree that people can show and receive love, can grow. I know in my experience of marriage, I've become a far better human being because of my husband. Um, and so we have to name that. We have to say that as a reality. Uh, but to answer your question, um, I think it's about how we train people to think about morality in the Catholic Church. So I don't know if, I don't know if there are other teachers in the audience, um, but one of the things that I find different between uh, high school students and college students is that in high school, there's this notion that when you write a paper or you take an exam, you start off at 100%, you lose two points here, and you lose three points here, and you lose 10 points here, and you get down to 85, and that's what your grade is. And so my college students come to me, and they're like, why did I get a B? Where did I lose the 15 points? Right. And, I, and, and what I say back to them is I say, you know, imagine, like, you go to an old county fair, and there's that, that thing that you hit with a mallet, remember that? And it goes up to a certain point. And I'm like, you hit it, and it only went up to this point. And there are two very different ways of thinking about goodness and badness, mm -hmm. right? So is there a, an ideal and you lose points and that's mm -hmm. the less bad model? Or is it that we train ourselves relationally to gradually better and better and better model the love of God in our relationships? And I think that if we were able to talk about sexuality and relationships in that county fair model, that we tried getting it higher each time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than in the demerit, model, we might have a really interesting discourse about the morality of sex. Can I respond to that? Sure. That's, I love the way you say uh, a relationship that reveals the reign of God. That's so beautiful. And I actually am much more comfortable talking about love. Mm. And I, I want to come back to something you said, because I thought it was very insightful. Um, all of what you're saying is very insightful. The, I have a friend whose name is Mark, who might be watching. Hi, Mark. Who was a um, member of a religious order for quite a bit, I'd say about seven or eight years. And he left his order, not the Jesuits, and um, he um, uh, is a gay man, he came out. I knew him actually in Africa, so that's a, that's a very nice carving, by the way, we used to sell them in Africa. Um, and uh, he came out and has been with his partner for 20 years, uh, his partner Craig. And his partner has a fairly serious illness that is at sometimes extremely serious and requires a lot of attention. Mark has cared for him for, I think, 15, 20 years now. 
And one of the questions I, want the, I, wa I would like the church, the institutional church to reflect on is your deeper question. Is this not love? And I, well, and I do not understand how a person could say the following things. This is not love. This is a lesser love. They should be apart. They should have never met. They should never be together. So I, I'm more comfortable talking about love. The second example is even more unusual, I would say. Uh, St. Cecilia's Parish in Boston, which is a very, very LGBT-friendly parish. Um, and a couple came up to me, and I apologize if I use, particularly in New York and at Fordham, if I use the wrong terminology. I'm kind of new to a lot of this terminology. So a couple came up to me, and there was a transgender woman, right, a woman who had been born as a man, who had transitioned. And I think you would say a cisgender woman, a woman who, I hope this is the right way to say it, a woman who was born a woman and is still a woman, okay? So they came up to a very nice couple, and my, I'll share something with you. My approach to people who might feel like they're in the margins of the church is to go the extra mile, to really try to make them feel welcome. And so we were talking, and uh, she said to me, as I recall, well, we've been married for, whatever, 20 years. And I'm always very careful about not offending. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Wasn't same-sex marriage only legal recently? And she said, the cisgender woman, oh, no, I married her when she was a man. And I said to my, the very first question that came, honest to God, the first question that came to my mind was, what can the church learn from them about fidelity? And so these are the kinds of questions that I think we need to be at. And this is why I don't think we're even near the theological questions, because the institutional church has not even asked those questions because they don't know those people. And one of the reasons they don't know those people is because those people, I don't say those people, people like that wonderful couple don't feel comfortable you know, speaking about that in most places. And this brings me back to one, one thing you said, which yeah. I, I want to come back to. To say, I mean, there are many priests who are gay and celibate. There are many sisters who are lesbian and celibate. There are many religious brothers who are celibate. You know, everyone knows that. That... sort of live healthy, effective lives reveals that the people who wrote those documents and many in the institutional church simply do not know those people. Mm -hmm. Like the people like Mark or this couple or gay priests who are you know, able to talk about their sexuality. And so that I think is, is the start. And that's why I really put, you know it's funny, the elephant in the room right now um, is because we can't get to that elephant be, be, until we actually have I would love to have a bishop meet that couple. I would love to have a bishop meet my friend Mark and his husband now and listen to them because that I think is the great block. And the reason they're not listening is because I think they feel they're giving up too much by even attending to them. And you see this online with the reaction of the book. Even the idea that we would learn from LGBT people who are married such as yourself or my friend Mark or this couple is so, use the word, anathema to them that we can't get to that other elephant. And so that's why I really put such an emphasis on dialogue and listening first. What Pope Francis calls the culture of encounter and the culture of accompaniment. And to me, I think that kind of, for me, sort of predates some of the other stuff. Anyway, thanks for letting me respond. Yeah. Can, can I jump in real quick on this? So there was something that Jim said that I thought was really, really important, um, which is you said that the, the bishops and the institutional church haven't asked these questions um, with regard to, say, this couple from St. Cecilia's and so on and so forth. And, 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 and you're right. And, and yet there's a paradox because the bishops and the institutional church have also answered <laughs> those questions. So, so, so let me just step back as someone who, who, on a sort of sociological and theological level, um, that studies the LGBT Catholic experience. Um, so we had a conference here a few years ago, and there was a, a Catholic trans woman who was there. 
Um, and, and she recorded that, that when, when she described her situation to church authorities, uh, the answer was given that she had engaged in a form of mutilation. Um, the official teaching hardly addresses the trans experience, but to the extent that it does, it treats it as a form of self-mutilation. Then, on top of that, we have to deal with the fact that um, this, this couple, who would now be a female-female couple, um, their marriage is described as, as effectively being without value, um, that, that the church has stood in the public square against their marriage, whether or not they're Catholic. And that's a piece we haven't gotten to talk about yet. Um, Jim wrote a wonderful book about the relationship between the Catholic church and the LGBT community. Sometimes I think you meant the LGBT Catholic community. Right. And, and I want to stand up for LGBT non-Catholics who have been on the receiving end of Catholic church advocacy in the public square where they don't have so we have this mutilation language, we have this notion that morally they need to separate from each other. Well, you know what, I was, that's, a, I, I, that's a great question. That is the question. And I do not presume to answer it. And so for me, it's more this idea that, that, that Jesus a relationship in the church. For me, it's why would you let anyone put that we don't But I feel that be leaven in the church. But, uh, you know, I, I feel that each individual is called into the church at their baptism, not only for their own spiritual growth, but also for the church. And so I think the church at St. Cecilia's in Boston, in the archdiocese, in the United States, in the world would be poorer without that couple. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense... That's, that's why they stay. Now, that's a, that's a burden to place on people because it's saying you have a call and a responsibility. But I, I and, it, and, and I'm just gonna confess something. I, I, I have a hard time with, you know, why should I stay? Because for me, the answer is this is your home. This is your family. Jesus Christ called you into this. And so to trust that you have a role to play that, is, that could be life-changing. So, for example, this, let's, let's say this, this, this guy, the, the, the father of the young boy who meets the bishop. If he had said, I'm leaving, then the bishop might have never experienced this moment of conversion mm -hmm. that it seems like he has. So that's my answer. Now, I say, I leave that to everybody's conscience, too. That is not the be-all and end-all for everybody. That is not prescriptive. That's just my way of looking at it as a Jesuit. I think we're starting to see why some of these issues are bring about such sort of visceral reactions in people because it really is oh, like yeah. I was just thinking right now of you know I'm always drawing um, metaphors from this but when I was giving birth getting an epidural if you've ever had an epidural there's a moment where it uh, hits your um, epidural space and it really does send like a, a, a tingle through your whole body and that's really freaky and electric and I think that that's what when I say touch that really is what touching a nerve means, and it's whole of the community, right? It has a repercussion through the whole LGBT community. It has repercussions through the whole Catholic community, right? What do we mean when we talk about the church? How capacious can we be when we talk about the people of God? How capacious can we be when we talk about marriage without reducing heterosexual or homosexual marriage to sex? Because remember, every time we objectively disorder homosexual marriage, we automatically christen any kind of heterosexual marriage, which is not, not all of which are life-giving, right? Many of which are death-dealing, yeah. right? Women are more likely to die from violence by their domestic partner than anybody else. Yeah. So, you know, in the same breath that we condemn, we elevate and therefore condemn some women to death. Mm. And so, I think what we're being called to here is sort of a more, a, a broader, more capacious, more complex, and 
a more ambiguous understanding of these things, which is what makes a lot of people nervous. It does. Right. And it, that makes me sad, actually, because I, I continually come back to my friend Mark and his husband. And I continually say, and, and maybe this is a failure of mine to imagine someone else, maybe it's arrogant, but I have a hard time imagining how even the most traditionalist, homophobic, um, close-minded Catholic cannot look at my friend and say, that is a loving act, and that is a, a form of love that I don't understand, but that I have to reverence. That is, and maybe that's why it's hard for me to kind of respond to some of these critics, uh, because I, I don't understand that. That is maybe a failure in my imagination to understand how people cannot see that. Right. No, I think you're right. I do want to remind you that you are invited to submit questions and that there will be students walking around picking them up and bringing them forward. So please um, start thinking about that as I continue um, with this. So as you're calling us to this more, I know, it feels like it's very ambiguous, but at the same time, when you see an example of it, it's really not ambiguous at all, right? It seems very obvious, right? Very obvious that this is kind of a love relationship, that this is a life-giving sort of thing. Nevertheless, the church's, the institutional church's treatment of LGBT Catholics has been a cause of what scholars call, scholars like Patrick call, deconversion, right? Leaving the church. A lot of people do leave. So Patrick, we've all seen the trends in disaffiliation. I assume many people have read the Pew study on the rise of the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, the, the no affiliation um, persons. And Catholicism especially is, you know, hemorrhaging really sticks, right? Disaffiliated parents tend to raise disaffiliated children who remain disaffiliated for their lives. So how is disaffiliation related in your study and in your experience to the experience of the LGBT community and its allies? So, so it's a great question. Um, the numbers are, sh are, are quite striking. Mm -hmm. um, something like 30% of those under 35 in the US no longer identify with any particular religious tradition. Um, something between one in three and one in four people raised Roman Catholic, no longer identify as Roman Catholic. Um, and Catholic numbers in the U.S. remain roughly constant um, because immigration of new Catholics um, is the thing that balances out the departures of many existing Catholics. And there are some important racial disparities in those numbers that are really worth noting and reflecting on. Um, there was a study three or four years ago out of a research unit in the U.K., um, and the question was, when you hear the word Christianity, what do you think? Um, and the leading, or one of the, one of the two or three leading responses to that question was homophobic. And this isn't Catholicism, this is Christianity broadly conceived. Um, and it's in the UK, so it's a different context to ours. Um, but the leading response to the question, what is Christianity, is homophobic. Um, so that just shows you a little bit of a sense of how far um, all the churches, all of the Christian churches have to go. Um, and, and the numbers that we see through more detailed research studies suggest um, that m one of the reasons that many people leave is that often says being treated like dirt. I think that's, I think that's about right. Um, and, and so I think it would be, I think it would be horrible if the Catholic Church started uh, treating LGBT people better in order to keep them in church, <laughs> right? The, I mean, that's probably not the best reason that we could think about for, for doing that. But, but I think we have to think about what is the cumulative effect of statements by individual priests, by church leaders, by church organizations. Um, and what is, the, what is the cumulative effect of, of those sorts of statements, which admittedly do get reported on quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, in people's views of, of the Catholic Church? And, and that goes back in, in a very serious way uh, to, the, to the issue that Jim raised a few minutes ago. There, there are a number of people in this room that I have, the, have had the great privilege of getting to know as, as, as friends and colleagues who have made a really tough, really principled decision. Um, that, as you put it, they're not going to be forced out of their own church, that they belong, and that no matter what is said, they are home. Mm -hmm. And I have all the respect in the world uh, for people who make that decision. I, I will confess in my own life to not being able to, to persevere in that particular way. So I, I was received into the Episcopal Church a couple of years ago. Um, in part, that's because my husband is discerning the priesthood in the Episcopal Church, and it's you know, it's, it's a helpful thing when, when the whole family can go to church together and get married in church and all of those sorts of things. And, and the reason that there's not a day that goes by 
that I don't mourn being a Catholic in some serious way. And one of the reasons that I spend my time at a Catholic university and a Jesuit university is because I have such deep reverence for the Catholic tradition, for the charism of the Society of Jesus. Um, and I discovered that I was a better person, better able to do this work when my own spiritual community would look at me and say, we accept you as a whole person. We don't just accept the part of you that's an academic. We don't just accept the part of you that tries to do well in this, that, and the other way. But we accept your life, your love, your relationships, your friendships. Um, and, and that has been exceptionally life-giving to me and has allowed me to return um, into the space of, of the Catholic Church, which I desperately love. Um, and what's funny is that in our parish, St. Bart's, over on Park Avenue, 29% of the parishioners are ex-Catholics. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them why they're not there, the two issues that come up are sexuality and women's ordination. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of very significant work that needs to be thought about, not just to arrest the decline in Catholic numbers, mm -hmm. but, but to ask the question, are there things mm -hmm. that, that the Catholic Church can learn from its sister and brother churches mm -hmm. um, on how to regard people as whole persons? I'm so sorry, I took up more time than I should. That's all right. I want to, I want to keep building on this notion of dialogue. Jim, the second half of the book, which we haven't touched on, even though it's half the book, is about prayer. Right? And particularly, I'm seeing a lot of questions um, from the audience about um, what to tell, for instance, what to tell uh, middle school and elementary school teachers about bullying. Right? Mm -hmm. if, this, if the church, especially the Roman Catholic schools, are required to teach church doctrine, how do you contextualize, given that, that bullying of LGBT uh, young people is so prevalent, how do you, what programs can we put in place, what ideas do we have for that? Um, should we form gay straight alliances? And my question to you is, um, as, a, as a, someone who's in, in the pastoral sphere, <clears throat> what is the role, do you think, of prayer? What is it in, I mean, I don't want to get personal, but like, is it a starting point? Is it like you're so frustrated and all you can do is pray? Is it an end point? Do you throw up your hands and say only God can fix this? That's a very good question. I mean, I would start off, I mean, you mentioned bullying. Uh, in the book I say, this was not my idea, but this was someone else who suggested my writing it this way, that Thank you. the Catholic wow. Church has vast experience in education, in high schools and colleges and universities. And so the Catholic Church should actually take the lead in anti-LGBT bullying um, because I mean, for the simple reason that it, you know, that's an act of violence and any kind of bullying is, is bad, is, I would say, immoral. But also because LGBT youth have a proportionally higher rate of suicide, right? And so it needs to be framed as a life issue for the church and for schools. So I think that the church, you know, in terms of sex abuse, the, the, the U.S. Bishops Conference have said that they want to be seen as kind of the leader in kind of safe environment programs, and I would say that they need to be seen as a leader in safe environment programs for this, because in large part, a lot of the bullying comes from this kind of cultural milieu in which the Catholic Church has been seen as anti-gay, just plain, I mean, not sexual act or the orientation, but just anti-gay. In terms of the prayer, um, I actually think that the second part of the book is more important than the first part of the book, uh, because the second part of the book when I wrote it, I was thinking a lot of LGBT youth. You know, there, as far as I could tell, there was really nothing out there that used the tools of Ignatian spirituality. Maybe there is, maybe I don't know about it, but the, they used the tools of Ignatian spirituality to invite people in an Ignatian way and in a prayerful way to come to encounter the scriptures as an LGBT person and to use particular passages. I talk about Zacchaeus, the Roman centurion, Psalm 139, a few others to come to experience the living God. Uh, and one of the ways I try to do that, you know, I try to help them with uh, Ignatian prayer, you know, just prayer in general, but to ask reflection questions and to kind of look at the scriptures and to see the way Jesus treats people. And I think that for so many people, and I get a lot of messages from young people through Facebook and email and phone calls and letters, and if you are in New York, you are very lucky. You can go to out at St. Paul's, the Church of St. Paul the Apostle. You can go to the Church of St. Francis Xavier. You can go to, I mean, endless varieties of places where you can go, right? If you're in a tiny little parish in middle America in a small town and you're a young boy or a lesbian girl, there's really very little that you can do. And that breaks my heart 
And so, who can you access and who can you encounter? And that's God in your prayer. And you can certainly, I think, look at some of these stories, like especially Zacchaeus and the Roman centurion, and see Jesus, a Jesus who is continually reaching out to people on the margins with a sense of welcome first. And so the prayer, frankly, is first, middle, and last, because the point of the church is to bring us into an encounter with Jesus. Uh, and, but for a lot of people, their churches prevent that. And I would say, actually, the word I thought you were going to use, I think that when the church, the Catholic church and the Christian church at large, prevents people, prevents LGBT people from coming into an encounter with the living God, it is a scandal. I mean, it's a literal scandal. It is a stumbling block, you know, from the Greek scandal on. But it's scandalous to me that people would feel less than and that Jesus would be blocked. Can I just suggest something? So this, this, one of the stories I like I mentioned was Zacchaeus. And you know the story of Zacchaeus, who's short in stature. He's in the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus was in town. Zacchaeus was the chief tax seen as the chief sinner, Scripture scholars tell us. Right now, we think, oh, tax collector. Are uh, at the time, chief tax collector meant chief sinner. So Jesus is going through Jericho, which is a large town, and it's towards the end of his mission, right? It's towards the end of his public ministry. So presumably, he has a lot of people with him. And Jericho is one of the largest towns there is in Judea at that time. So presumably, there are a lot of people watching Jesus. He goes through Jericho, Zacchaeus is short in stature. He cannot see, as the Gospels say, because of the crowd. Now, think of Zacchaeus as an emblem of LGBT people, not as a sinful person, because we're all sinful, but as someone who feels marginalized. He can't see Jesus because of other people. He climbs out onto the sycamore tree. He literally goes out on a limb <laughs> to see Jesus. The gospel says it's so poignant because he wanted to see who Jesus was. That's like LGBT people. They are prevented from doing that. And suffer sometimes even embarrassment. Imagine Zacchaeus going up in that tree as the tax collector. How embarrassing it would have been. People laughing at him. Jesus comes through the town. Now here's the point. What does Jesus do? To whom does Jesus go? You. Come down from that tree. The person who is most marginalized comes down, and I've been reflecting on this in the past couple of weeks, the crowd, says Luke, grumbles, as they do today. They do not like to see Jesus going out to someone who's on the margins. And Zacchaeus, the Greek, what little Greek I know, the Greek is stathes. He stands his ground. It's such a beautiful image for me of the LGBT Catholic. And Jesus says, and he says, you know, I'm coming to your house. It's a sign of public welcome. They hated that. And Zacchaeus has this conversion. I will repay anyone I have defrauded. Right? Now I'm not talking about conversion therapy or he stops being, you know, an LGBT person has to stop being who they are. It's the kind of conversion, the metanoia that we're all called to, right? Because for Jesus, it's welcome first. He doesn't say you're a sinner. He could have. And so when I present these stories and try to ask these, ask these questions of people, it's to help people encounter... I mean, I really, honest to God, my, my image is of a 14-year-old boy reading this book in his bedroom alone. And I want him to encounter the same Jesus that Zacchaeus encountered, the same Jesus that you and I encounter, and the same Jesus that straight people are allowed to encounter. Yeah. So that's, that's the reason for the second part of the book. And that's why I think it's more important, because the first part is my invitation to dialogue, which is limited, you know, as we're talking. The second part is an invitation to Jesus, who is not limited, in his outreach to anybody. And so for me, that's, those, that's the important part of the book. Okay. So can I pick up on that just really quickly? Yeah, sure. It has to be so quick. <laughs> Super quick. So, so, so I would encourage all of you. I've been sitting with Jim's meditations um, ever since I picked up the book. And I've, I've, I've sat and done them in an Ignatian style. And, and they, they repay a lot. But I'm stuck on Zacchaeus. 
And, and the reason I'm stuck on Zacchaeus is the same reason I'm stuck on the Roman centurion, which is that these are people who are agents of oppression. So Zacchaeus is a tax collector on behalf of the Romans. They are extorters. Um, he is the chief sinner, not because he's like a nasty guy that, you know, like does things that hurt one or two people. He's stealing money from his fellow townspeople in the same way that the Roman centurion is there as the guard of the imperial force that's terrorizing the Jewish people. And so I, I, I find it hard, maybe, maybe just a, as an LGBT person, to, to immediately make that link, but there's a better one that you have. And this is the Good Samaritan. Mm. So the other parable that Jim includes in the book is the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, and it's not the Samaritan. It's the guy who's just trying to do his thing. And he's going, I can't remember if he's going from Jerusalem to Jericho or the other way around. Um, but he's on the road, and he's set upon by robbers. Um, and, and we all know that the world is a tough place for LGBT folks, religious or not religious. Um, and then the cleric walks by and doesn't do anything. And then the other cleric walks by and doesn't do anything. And then it's the fellow outcast that steps in. Um, and, and that's such an important piece for us to, to, to connect ourselves to. The notion that, that what in, in activist circles might be called allyship um, is so valuable. And oftentimes, the support that LGBT people get isn't from those in power, but it's from those who share some experience of marginalization. Um, and so I would offer that as a counterpoint mm -hmm. to, to the Zakia story. OK. I have to ask you to wrap up, but in your closing statements, this is the privilege of the moderator, I'm going to ask you to address one or both of these questions that came from the audience. As you can see, I have a lot of questions that came from the audience, so I'm trying my best to represent what I think I'm hearing over and over again. The first one that I've gotten multiple uh, questions about is a cultural question. The church is worldwide. And in many places in the church, um, homosexuality is, aside from being a sin, it is a crime. And so what is the responsibility of the church, or how does the church navigate its global perspective, particularly when the United States is in a different cultural place than other places in the world? That's one. The second is a question about coming out. And particularly, Jim, to your issue of the bishops haven't met LGBT folk. If there are priests and sisters and brothers that are gay, then they have met them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Math. <laughs> but maybe they don't know. That's right. And so is there a responsibility, or is there a certain, not a responsibility, but a call to a brave act of coming mm -hmm. out that is sort of uh, incumbent upon particularly people who are in, that have a foot in each, in the LGBT community and in the church. So you can answer one or both. We have four minutes for the two of you. Enjoy. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take Please. the second one if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll bet you so will. the second question I'll take very briefly to give Patrick some time. Um, why don't gay priests, religious uh, lesbian sisters, and gay brothers come out? And there are a couple of reasons. Number one, the most common reason is that they are told not to. So remember, these are people who are under a, either a promise of obedience or a vow of obedience, priests or religious. And so they are told not to by their bishops or their religious superiors who are afraid for many reasons. That's the first reason. That's the most common. Second reason is they themselves don't want to come out because they are shy or they're embarrassed or they're uh, you know, worried. The third reason is that they have been actually sort of the, the recipients themselves in their parishes, for example, of, of hate speech or something like that. And so they're afraid. This keeps them in this kind of the church. There are maybe a hand, there are probably four or five priests who I know who are publicly out. One of them is going to be writing an article for us in America Magazine. And I mean out, out, as in out to their bishops, out to their parishes. And I called this guy the other day. His name's Fred Daly. It's not a secret. He's up in uh, upstate New York. And I said, well, how has it been? It's been about 10 years. I wrote an article about him for the tablet in London in 1995, I think, 20 years. And he said, fine. And I said, has there been any problems? No. You know, people accept him. And, and the great loss is, it's a, it's a big topic, the great loss is not only for these individuals, but for the church at large. Because the church at large is, is prevented from reflecting on other models and other individuals who are LGBT. And so, of course, priests would not always talk about being gay you know, from the pulpit. But imagine, it's the same problem with you know, not having women preaching. 
this lack of experience. Imagine after Orlando, if a gay priest could have stood up in front of his parish and talked about being bullied as a gay boy. That is an experience that we are missing. And so I hope that now, how will they do that without the, 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 without the bishops giving them uh, permission? I'm not sure. I mean, it would be, you know, it would be breaking one vow or one promise to sort of something that they would probably consider higher. But I hope that the day comes when bishops and religious superiors are able to say, uh, be yourself, you know. And, you know, as someone uh, once said, the truth will set you free. That's good. So to stick with the Bible theme, um, <laughs> in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Right. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> amen. Amen. Um, imagine a first century world where slavery isn't just practiced but the norm and unquestioned, mm -hmm. where misogyny isn't just practiced but Imagine how scandalous, in the best possible sense, they would have been in that first century world. And what the Christian church, which in the first century was able to be that beacon of hope, much as it had many, many problems still in the first century, um, can't do that on this issue in the 21st century. Because God knows that there are enough other countries in the world where the church's message on immigration, for instance, today of all this can't do um, unless we have a real confrontation with reality. We're not going to find real healing. If we have only a superficial reconciliation we're only going to have superficial healing. And so one of the takeaways that I've gotten from this conversation is at the bottom of all of the topics that we've talked about is our dear friend Thomas Aquinas and behind him our other dear friend Aristotle. That that teaching, which is to say that LGBT attractions and loves are less than because they are disordered, is the thing that under the arguments about just discrimination. It's the reason for the arguments about why parishes can't have the kinds of ministries that they want to have. And so Jim has begun this conversation. Um, he's offered us this invitation to dialogue. But if this is going to be a dialogue, we have to get to the next level, not just how do we relate to each other and how do we listen to each other. But the question is, what is true? What is right and what is good? And, and I believe the truth will set us free. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Um, right outside, there's a reception sponsored by me.